Welcome to Section 3, Policy Impact. What I tried to do is lay out those long-term... Welcome to Section 3, Policy Impact. What I've been trying to do is to give you an intense overview of what are the big trends affecting us Hello, welcome to Section 3, Policy Impact. The first section, we took a look at what was going on with the pandemic, what the long-term trends are. The second thing is we looked at the current economic environment from the perspective of the GDP and the labor force. We're now going to take a look at how policy impacts these. Policies tend to be more short term, but they do have a long term impact. So let's look at policy impact and we're going to look at it from a government policy. And it has two components, the monetary policy, which is interest rates and the money supply. And then there's fiscal policy, which is taxation and spending. Um, what we really look at is uh, it's global and this hap it's different in different countries and cultures it's not just financial but it's social actions so what we really have is policy input and as a result what we have is results these are the consequences intended or unintended that come from government action so you have the results, you have the output. So one is what is actually done in the policy. The second is the impact of them. Together, it's the policy impact. Now that I totally confused you, let me go back and say, first thing is the government or an agency or a governing body makes a policy. Then they're the results of the policy. So first is what they do, and then the impact of them. The impact is a combination of the both of them. Okay? The first one, the first one we're going to take a look at is, uh, damn. Welcome to section three. In the first section, we took a look at the imp. Hello, welcome to section three, policy impact. In section one, we talked about the pandemic and mega trends that are happening over a long period of time. Second, we looked at the current economic picture and the future based on the GDP in the labor force. In this section, we are going to take a look at what is the impact of policy on the current economic and future economic conditions. We're going to look at it from the government policy perspective, and it's broken into two pieces, monetary, interest rates, money supply, fiscal, tax, and spending. The policy impact is a result of two things. First, what is the actual actions that a, gov or of an, a governing body does? What are the actions the governing body is engaging in? And the second is the result or consequence of those. They can be intended or unintended. This is not a pure mathematical exercise. And the result, the impact, is really um, the output, what the agency or body is doing, and then they're the results. Okay, so we do want to distinguish them as we move forward. 
Uh, monetary policy is generally done by central banks. Um, most countries have them, and in the United States, it's the Federal Reserve Bank. And when we look at what it is, is Congress oversees the Federal Reserve and its entities. The president appoints members. But there's the Board of Governors, and it's an independent agency of the federal government. They do not report to the president. Uh, they then have the local Federal Reserve banks, and then they have the Open Market Committee. So the Board of Governors is what drives the monetary policy of the United States. Let's back up for a second and say what drives interest rates overall. And uh, the more money is in demand, the higher the rate. The lower the demand, the lower the price. Basic supply and demand as we talked up front. Then you look at risk and return profile. The longer the term of, of the loan or the time period that's being lent, the higher the rate because you're taking on more risk over a period of time. The shorter the term, the lower the risk because you have time to make it back up. Now, we also look at credit. The higher the credit or the risk of not getting paid, the higher the rate. The better the credit, the lower the rate. Now, U.S. government securities have no principal risk, but they do have inflation risk. So if we start our discussion with monetary policy, uh, what drives interest rates, um, we can then move into what is the role of the Federal Reserve so that we can see what their actions are, their policies, and the t intended and unintended consequences. The Federal Reserve has a dual mandate. They want price stability, which means that we don't have inflation nor deflation that is running too hot or too cold. Maximize unemployment, okay? And it's, we have tended to see that the higher, that the lower the, the maximum employment level um, and the inflation is low and expected to remain low is when we would have growth. So this is the dual mandate that they have. Earlier last week, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve made a very important decision. And in the past, that what they would do is raise and change interest rates, not only for full employment, as we talked about previously, but to control inflation. So they would increase or decrease rates based on what inflation is. The change that they made is that they would no longer be guided by anticipated inflation, but focus on, um, focus on employment and not respond to inflation until it was a real thing. Um, under this strategy, um, the Fed is not going to take any steps to cool the labor market unless there's clear evidence of inflationary pressure. Not just a forecast, but real things. Um, and that is their belief that the robust job market can be sustained without causing an outbreak of inflation. Uh, the fascinating thing, we'll have to watch that. We can see what inflation has run. And uh, what we have found is that inflation is relatively low at the current point. Um, so let's just keep going. Is uh, What are the tools that the Federal Reserve Bank has? And they have a number of... Um, tools that they can use, uh, open market operations, which means they can buy and sell treasury bonds to affect bank reserves. How much does the bank have to keep in a reserve? Um, the major form of monetary policy is open markets. Okay, the Discount window is you can lend a member bank to affect bank reserves because banks have to keep a certain percentage of their um, deposits on deposits with the Fed, okay? So they target a Fed funds rate. When you go to the discount window of the Fed, you're borrowing for the Fed overnight, short-term money, and they call it, the rate they charge is the Fed funds rate, okay? 
in the past, the discount window, window has been the lender of last resort. Generally, banks will try to fund each other and not engage the Fed. Next thing the, the Fed can do is change the reserve ratio. How, many, how much do they need to actually keep on deposit? So those are the three tools, open market, discount window, and reserve ratio. Those are the tools they have to implement monetary. Let's take a look at what current rates are. And this is as of 5 p.m. on Friday the 28th. Um, and this shows our 30-year bond rate. And when you think about it right here, this is the yield, okay, that right now investors are willing to invest in 30-year bonds to earn 1.5%. That's saying inflation is going to most likely be low. But look at 0.72 on 10 years. The one-year T-bill borrowing money, a 0.124. Uh, these are historically low levels. Now, I want to just show you the what we call the yield curve. And the yield curve, this is the current one, which shows one month to 30 year. And you see it's relatively flat for three years and starts to go up. If we look at August of last year, it was actually inverted. Shorter rates were higher than long-term rates. This is an inverted, somewhat of a, a flat to normal curve. And if we go back to 18, we can see, look at the difference. Okay, We had your one-year money, if we're looking at it here, one-year money was about 210 in 18, and now the two-year money, there, there's 25, now it's what we just saw right here, 0.156, okay? So the other thing that we look at carefully is the difference between 10-year and one-year money. And when we look at the difference, we can see here that this inverted curve, meaning that short-term money, okay, is more expensive than long-term. And this inverted curve has predicted the past seven recessions. We're in a recession right now. So that gives us a sense of what's happening. The bank is taking extraordinary actions in this time of crisis. They've done a few things. They've reduced the Fed Fund's target rate from 0 to 0.25. So that means that if you can't find somebody to lend to you in the overnight market, and this is for banks, that you can borrow from the Fed at a rate of between 0 and 0.25%. The other thing they've done, and they've given guidance that they intend to keep this rate low for a period of time. The markets like financial stability. Uh, the security purchases, they try to provide liquidity. This is liquidity, and they've purchased over $3.5 trillion in the past couple of months. These are U.S. Treasury, Treasury bonds, notes, bills also includes government guaranteed mortgages such as Ginnie Mae and Fannie Mae. Uh, this is to provide liquidity into the system. Uh, they're lending uh, to securities dealers, very low 90-day loans to the primary dealers. Primary dealers are those that sell the securities of the United States. The Treasury does not, for the most part, sell them directly. Most of them are bought and sold through primary dealers. Um, they're backstopping money market mutual funds to keep them at a dollar. Um, the re repo market um, is over one trillion overnight, again, to keep liquidity, keep money flowing. They're doing direct lending to banks at the past. If you had to go to the Fed window to borrow, oh, that was bad. Today it's not so bad. They're encouraging it. Um, they've set up international swap lines with other banks so that we can continue to keep trade going and access to U.S. dollars. Um, they've eased some of the regulations. So these things have, are tools that the Fed is using. It's keeping liquidity or cash moving so that we don't seize up. It doesn't help with solvency. Okay? Very important to understand the difference of liquidity, which is keeping cash available versus solvency of a company. They're two very, very different things. Um, they're also engaging in things that they've never done before. 
And to me, this is rather scary, but I think it's indicative of what's going on. They are becoming a direct lending to major corporate employers by buying corporate bonds. In the past, they were all government or government guaranteed securities. So they've taken on a little more risk. Direct lending to states and municipalities, um, buying bonds secured by auto loans and credit cards to keep that market going. Because if a bank or lender wants to issue credit auto loans to consumers, they need the funds to do that. Okay, So what a bank or lender would do is take a pile of auto loans, package them up, and could sell them now to the Federal Reserve who would keep them on their balance sheet, thus providing more cash for that lender to make more auto loans. Okay. So that's uh, what we're seeing on the monitor.